Uh, well, I'm Michael Crandall. I'm a visiting assistant professor of Japanese literature and film here at Indiana University. Um, uh, teaching classes on Japanese cinema, uh, also literature. Um, but my research focuses on Japanese film and particularly Japanese horror film. Um, so looking at kind of the history of the horror film genre in Japan and how that has influenced um, kind of contemporary horror films around the world, really. One of the things that I think East Asian cinema does really well is cross borders. Um, I mean, there's a lot of talk, especially about Japan and more recently South Korea and China and soft power. Um, so, you know, things like anime and, and manga originally, but then also going into things like horror films and Korean dramas, uh, TV dramas even, and you know, these big Chinese epics that now have people like Matt Damon <laughs> headlining them. Um, so there's, there's this awareness, I think, in East Asia that they have a cultural hot product. Um, and there's also, I think, a consciousness that they can use this to kind of increase cultural awareness um, abroad. And I mean, sometimes there's a bit of pandering. I, again, you know, you put Matt Damon in your, your Chinese martial arts epic. Um, but I think on the whole, especially with Japan and South Korea, there has been an understanding that we don't have to change who we are as, as represented in our films um, for people abroad to be interested. Um, in fact, that's precisely why people are interested in them because it is this alternative um, kind of pop entertainment. Um, and so I think there's been a, a, a very conscientious attempt in the part of these um, filmmaking traditions to kind of leave the culture as is. Um, and I think that's well, that, that, I think that's a lot of the appeal of these films. And I was happy when I saw the, the selection here. Um, it's, I think it does what any kind of film series like this on a college campus should do, which is uh, try and give students a little bit of a grab bag. So things that you know, maybe people are already familiar with, um, you don't want to just throw out you know, stuff like Spirited Away. Um, Spirited Away is, I think, a film that um, more so than most um, young American kids are probably familiar with. A lot of them have probably seen it before. But it's an important film, um, and it's kind of a gateway film. Um, so I think by putting Spirited Away alongside uh, films that maybe aren't quite as well known, like 2046 or Kikujiro, um, you're inviting students to expand their horizons, where if you just had a bunch of films that maybe nobody had ever heard of, then they might just be turned off and say, well, I, I can't really get into this. Um, but by giving them things like Spirited Away and giving them things like Infernal Affairs, which I think a lot of people know is, uh, was remade as The Departed, um, it kind of brings people in and then maybe encourages them to stick around and watch something that they're not quite as familiar with, like Kikujiro. So I was trying to kind of put together a theme and I kind of hit upon this idea of uh, strong women and kind of strong families. Um, so all of the films I chose either have a very strong female protagonist or they're about families that are sticking together through adversity um, and sometimes both. Um, so that's a common thread. Um, that connects all of these films. Um, something else that kind of connects them all is that they're all kind of what I call genre bending films. So they're not films that are easily pegged into a single genre. Um, they're films that kind of mix comedy with uh, action or horror, uh, musicals. Uh, so there's all kinds of variety in there, um, but they still have this kind of unifying um, feeling to them. So. Uh, if I guess I was going to talk about them individually, so the first film I chose was Peking Opera Blues, um, which I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of. Uh, that's a Hong Kong film from the 1980s, and teaching Japanese cinema, I don't often get a chance to <laughs> talk about Hong Kong cinema, so I knew right away, I was like, oh man, this is my chance to, to kind of talk about Peking Opera Blues. Um, so Peking Opera Blues is a film by Choi Hark, who's sometimes called the Steven Spielberg of Hong Kong. 
Um, so in the 1980s, he was making a lot of kind of action-heavy fantasy films that were very much in kind of that Steven Spielberg uh, mode of filmmaking. Uh, Saving My Hubby, uh, which is one of the South Korean films I chose, is maybe more of a unconventional choice. Um, well, it's not... It's not one of the great South Korean films of the last 10 or, or 15 years or so. Um, it's a kind of a screwball comedy uh, from 2002. Um, and again, it is, it's not great cinema, but it stars one of my favorite actresses. It stars Pei Du Na, who is um, maybe familiar to American audiences through The Host, which was a, a South Korean monster film that was, that was reasonably popular here. Um, and she's been in things like Cloud Atlas, which the Wachowskis did, stuff like that. So Saving My Hubby is kind of a screwball comedy in which uh, her husband gets held for ransom by some gangsters and she has to kind of go out into the soul underworld to try and save him. And it has kind of a Tom and Jerry feel almost because there's lots of these chase scenes where she's being on the run and gangsters are chasing her. She's got a baby strapped to her back the whole time. So <laughs> it's just a lot of fun. Um, which is, again, I think part of the reason that East Asian cinema has been so popular abroad lately is that they, they know how to have fun. <laughs> so it's a fun film. X-Cross is uh, the, one of the Japanese films I chose. Uh, it's a bit of a horror film, which coming from me is probably uh, not too surprising. Uh, but it's a horror comedy. It's, it's a film that doesn't take itself very seriously at all. Um, and it's... I consider it to be kind of a criminally underrated, unknown film. It came out in Japan in 2007, and it didn't really do a whole lot. Um, but it's just, I think it's just a ton of fun. It really straddles the horror comedy line very, very well. Um, and this is a film about two girls who uh, from Tokyo, and they go to a hot springs resort to kind of get away from it all. and kind of like Deliverance, the, the Hot Springs Resort is run by these deranged hillbilly people. Um, but because it's kind of in this comedic vein, it kind of sidesteps any kind of maybe unpleasant, <laughs> politically incorrect things that might come of that. Um, because it's so absurd and it knows it's absurd. Um, and it's just, it's a lot of fun. So, uh, The Mermaid is, the most recent film I chose that's actually comes came out earlier this year. Um, it's directed by Stephen Chow, who is oh, yeah. famous for his Hong Kong comedy films, so Shaolin Soccer and Kung Fu Hustle and, and all of that. And he's not actually in front of the camera in this film. He he's he's kind of retired from acting, but he still directs. And The Mermaid was actually the highest grossing film in Chinese history. So it came out earlier this year and completely shattered box office records in China. And it's a film uh, that's very ecologically minded. So it's about a rich developer who is kind of a little bit in the, the Tony Stark mode, I think. I think there's a little bit of kind of the Marvel influence maybe there. Uh, but he's developing real estate um, next to the ocean and um, inadvertently polluting the ocean and there's a bunch of mermaids who are not happy about this. So they actually train a mermaid to walk on land and go seduce and assassinate him. <laughs> and hilarity ensues. So it's, it's got his trademark screwball cartoony sense of humor, but it also has a very kind of relevant contemporary message and it really resonated in China. The Quiet Family is um, about a uh, family that buys a mountain retreat in inn and they get it ready for business and they open it up and people start coming and they all start dying horrible deaths. <laughs> uh, and in order to kind of keep business going and not get a bad reputation, they decide to just start burying the bodies and not telling anybody about it. Um, and once again, hilarity ensues. When it was remade as Happiness of the Katakuris by a director named Mike Takashi, who uh, is sometimes called the Quentin Tarantino of Japan, uh, he's famous for these kind of 
hyper-violent, stylized, very self-referential kind of genre pieces. And when he remade The Quiet Family, he decided that it needed to be a musical. So he added musical numbers, he added zombies, he added intentionally bad animated sequences uh, for scenes where, that were called for special effects that they didn't have the budget for. They just shift to this really atrocious claymation style and there's no attempt to <laughs> pretend that it, that it looks good at all. And, and he adds a subplot about Queen Elizabeth II's uh, illegitimate half Japanese nephew who's a fighter pilot in the Iraq war. It's, <laughs> it's about as bonkers as you could imagine. Um, so hopefully if, if people come out, they'll come for both of these because they're both hilarious in their own ways. Um, well, I wanted to give students a mix of uh, more recent films and then maybe go back a little bit. I, I was uh, hesitant to go back past 1986, so that, that was the oldest film, Peking Opera Blues, that I, that I chose. Um, but hopefully uh, that will kind of lead people to maybe go back even further. So um, one of the things I find as I'm getting older is that the films that I think of as contemporary are actually 30 years old now. <laughs> so, people may not have seen these films. So uh, I knew I wanted to do something like The Mermaid, which was brand new. Um, and you know, you can't get more contemporary and of the moment than that. Um, and then I tried to stay kind of on right around the year 2000 and not go back too much further than that. But then uh, with Peking Opera Blues kind of showing that, you know, these traditions have this history behind them and you can go back further and further and hopefully you know if people see these films and their common denominators and find them all interesting then maybe they'd be willing to go back even further because there are of course there are great films like this you know from the 70s and the 60s and, and going way way back.